Okay, what we're learning today now is basically the theory of the, what's called the T version of the confidence interval. And then we'll hopefully see a practical example, and, and then we'll be, be, be finished for today's lecture. Um, in fact, that turns out to be the end of the material before the next test. So the next test will be, Monday will be a review day, and then the test will be Wednesday. I'll open it up maybe between Monday and Wednesday will be the, the test. Okay, so let's begin. So we have a population. I'm really repeating the beginning of chapter chapter eight now. Chapter eight, confidence intervals. And we would like to know the average of some characteristic, like, like average age, for example, was what we used last time. And so we, in order to do so, we take a sample we take a sample. We take a sample size. We get the average of those hundred people. And we plugged it into the formula, x bar plus or minus the z times the sigma over n. Well, the fact that the, the getting the sample size is no big deal. Well, I shouldn't say that. Let's, but I would ask you, which of these, maybe, I, maybe it's a good way to begin this, is to ask you, which of these four, these are the four parts of the formula that you needed to solve the problem previously. Not in the homeworks in the chapter, because the chapter doesn't really discuss this, but for the spinner assignment, which we did in class for the last two lectures. Which of these four numbers is difficult to get? Well, it turns out all four of them are difficult, but one turns out to be so difficult that we actually can't use it and we have to try a different version of the formula. So let's take it step by step. Uh, find a, let's say, find a 95% confidence interval estimate of mu. You know, like, what, what is the average? And we're trying to really guess what is the average of this whole population, because that tells you something about the whole population that's quite important. Like what's the average income, the average uh, hours that you work, et cetera. Okay, so can somebody please tell me either one answer or four answers, which of these four numbers is difficult to get, do you think, in your opinion, in real life? Laura, you were starting to raise your hand? Okay, well, that turns out to be the right answer, so let's put that aside for a second. Okay, so that's correct. But what are the other, what about the other three? Well, let's now it's a little ridiculous. We have the answer, so let me just go through it. Is the is the sample size hard to get? Well, for us it's not hard. The, the formula said, well, the problem will say you're using a sample size of hundred, so you just use a sample size, whatever. But in real life, you need to hire a statistician or know the formulas or know the the, the the know something in order to come up with the proper sample size. It's not a simple decision or a simple answer. What about the X bar? Well, the X bar is the hardest to get because the X bar means you do the actual work. You got to knock on a hundred doors. Ask them a question, talk to them, maybe get you know screamed at because you're bothering them. But after getting like a lot of data, getting the average is easy. But to get the data that goes into the average is quite difficult. What about the Z? How do you change the 95% into the Z? Well, the answer is you you can't do it unless you took a class in statistics. So you got to have a college education just to get the Z number. But assuming you know the Z, once you have the class, it's not that bit not a big deal. But as Laura said correctly, the sigma is not only difficult, it's almost impossible. Because what does the sigma refer to? Sigma refers to the actual spread of the data in the entire population. But the only way to know that number is if you have the entire population in front of you, which of course, if you had, you might as well calculate the mu of the population at that point. But the fact is you don't have the whole population of perhaps millions of people or billions of people in front of you. So the sigma, which we assumed last time was equal to two, it's really, uh, well, that was really artificial. In real life, you don't even know the sigma. So what's the next best thing? How would you, what would you substitute? And we did this in class, and I see some of you already know this. What would you substitute for the sigma, given that you still want to use the basic formula, but you don't want to change the formula around. What would you substitute for the sigma? And we said that somebody actually gave me the answer in class. We're going backwards in time. Yes. What? No, no, no. And for the case of a random number table, the amount of spread between 0 and 9 is 2.87. That was one of the few examples where we actually know the sigma correctly. But this is not the random number table. Here are the numbers. People's ages go from like 3 years old to 93 years old. The spread is much bigger, much different. Yes, Laura? Yeah, we have, this represents 100 numbers. And these 100 numbers, can, you plug it into the X bar formula. But the same 100 numbers can be plugged into the S formula which if you recall is x minus x bar squared over n minus one. So when you get the standard deviation of the sample, which is called s, that would be a good substitute for the sigma in the population. Will it be a perfect substitute? No, but it'll be a, it's a substitute. Now, 
So therefore, the formula we're going to use right now is going to be x bar plus or minus instead of sigma over n, it's going to be s over n. But now we have another modification to make, which is, do you think with the z, will everything else stays the same? And the answer is no, because which is more certain? If you knew the sigma or you know the s, which is a more accurate number? And obviously the answer is the sigma, if you have it, is the most the perfect number, because the s is trying to estimate that number. But the s will not be a perfect representation, so are you still 95% sure the answer is between here and here? The answer is no. Now you have to basically tell yourself, my formula, which is based partly on the s, may be wrong. In other words, the x bar might not be a perfect representation of the mu, which of course it won't be, but it'll hopefully close. And now the S won't be a perfect representation of the sigma. That's going to introduce, without getting into all the mathematics, more uncertainty. How do you compensate for that uncertainty? You make the interval wider. You give yourself some more insurance. So I'm still 95% sure, but now I'm basically dealing with a less precise or a wider interval. Now, how much wider are you going to stretch it out? Well, what does that depend upon? The amount, in other words, I'm claiming that this new method using this, the S is going to re require additional stretching of the interval. The question is, how much extra stretching? Well, before, what do you think it depends upon? What's going to determine if you need a lot of stretching or a little stretching? Yes? The sample size, very good, because, because if you have a really, really large sample size, then the S is probably very, very close to the sigma, so probably hardly maybe a tenth of 1% of extra stretching. If the sample size is small, this number here might be, as you did for the spinner assignment with a small sample size, this could be very far from the true value for sigma, in which case you really got to compensate by a lot of, so the amount of stretching of the Z is done automatically, so it sounds like, how do you figure it out? It's complicated, it turns out it's, in practice it's easy, once the formula was developed, uh, you go to, instead of the z-table, you go to the table right after the z-table called the t-table. And the t-table is very similar to the z, except it's more stretched out. But we have an additional complication, as I forgot your name again, your Anthony pointed out, that, that the, t the t can't be a single number. It's got to be a number that depends upon the sample size. So instead of depending upon the sample size, for technical reasons in particular, of course, that the bottom part of the formula is n minus one, it depends upon the n minus one. And the n minus one we call the degrees of freedom. So when you go to the t-table, there are two numbers you gotta look up. You gotta know the percentage, and you gotta know the something called the sample size minus one of the degrees of freedom, uh, which is abbreviated as df, some books use it as delta, this kind of symbol, but it's equal to n minus one. So in our example, it would be 100 minus 1, or 99, to finish up the example. So what about, so I told you, you gotta look up the percentage, and it's very similar. So what would be the, a picture of the, of the t? Well, if this is a picture of the z, the picture of the t would be also a bell-shaped curve, more or less. It's gonna have a zero value in the middle, but it's gonna be more stretched out. So instead of putting down, what we put down for the, what was the amount of stretching for the z? What number always went over here for the z? One. But now it's going to be maybe 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Depends upon the sample size. So don't bother, if you're making a picture, don't bother putting a number there. But don't put down a one there. Just like the z, we made a vertical lines at the end on the tails that represented a percentage of confidence. And then we use this basically to figure out how much is over here. Because that's how the z table is constructed. It gives you the area on the left side of the picture. But for some reason, which I can't fully explain or understand is the t table gives you the area on the right side which is the same number just on the right side so how do you figure that out it's one minus the percentage of confidence divided by two because there are two of them or even without a formula you should realize this is zero two five point zero two so the amount of area that we care about that chops off 95 percent is zero two five so after all is said and done what you got to do now is do three things turn to the t table Turn to the column label 025, and then go down to row number 99. So if you have the t-table with you, you can tell me that number. Now, before I go further, I'm going to guess the answer, because what did I just tell you? The t-table is similar to the z-table, just a little bit bigger. So what was the point, what was the number that we used last time, which I hope you still remember, for 95%? What was the numbers for, for the z, 95%? It's really worth memorizing this number, since it really is a good reference for all the other examples. 95% was what? for the z for 95%, plus or minus 1.96. So the new one got to be a lot bigger than 1.96 or a little bit bigger. Well, the sample size of 100 is pretty large. So it's got to be maybe 1.98, 1.99, maybe 2.00. So now turn to the t-table and please tell me what you're going to see there. You go down to, yes, Laura? Uh, 